So oh, it should be okay. Yes, the topic for, for today was uh, uh, inverse problems and scientific machine learning, but I will try to say some couple of words about also about uh, partial differential equations actually. So this is roughly the content. I won't be have time to go through all of these things. So we'll see what I decide to leave out. Uh, but essentially we'll say a couple of words about scientific machine learning in general. And then we'll give examples from inverse problems. And then I'll move on and say something about partial differential equations. Okay, uh, when you try to apply machine learning in, in natural sciences and in, in engineering sciences, you typically are faced with uh, challenge, challenges in those fields typically have different traits that, that kind of separates them from the classical application areas where machine learning has somehow shown this beautiful progress that we have seen. And, and one is, for example, that the, the systems are could be quite sensitive to perturbations. So that's essentially an ill posed uh, phenomena uh, where you have, uh, yeah, where small deviations could cause big, big changes in the, in the behavior. The systems are also quite large scale in nature, meaning that there are these uh, parameters that are governing the systems could be very high dimensional. I imaging is a typical example of that, where the entire image itself is a parameter. So even when you discretize it in a clever manner, we're talking about millions or even billions of degrees of freedom. Uh, there is a, often, quite often a lack of relevant training data. Uh, and relevant here refers to a situation where when you want to do decision making, you typically want to maybe understand the system when it fails. And in that context, you might have very little training data or even no training data. Or training data can be quite costly to acquire. So there is a constant, you're constantly starved for training data in these challenges. That's a typical setting. Was on, I don't think your slides are, are going forward. We're still on oh, slide one. Not. No, okay. we see slide one. You know what, then I should stop to the full screen and just share it without the full screen. Do the slides move now? They do. Oh, yeah. They do. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Let me nevertheless still stop the full screen share. And I'm sorry, guys, for, for this. So I'll keep it this way. Hopefully, we'll see the borders of the PDF, but that's perhaps acceptable. Yeah, that's fine. It, it worked yeah. well in the last last few also with the full screen. Excuse me. Did yeah, yeah, I, 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 yeah, I, yeah, but I kind of got a bit suspicious about the full screen. It might stop work again, and then let's let's go. <laughs> <with this. laughs> Computers, you never know, right? <laughs> we'll see if this stops. I don't know. We'll, we'll, let's try it this way. So, so feasibility also, of course, typically you might in in medical imaging, for example, you have quite tough time constraints and or it might even be on the fly decisions that needs to be made critical and there's no time for retraining a model for example so these are all typical uh, fee, uh, traits that are uh, popping up so scientific machine learning is a collective i would say it's a fairly ah, it's a rather recent terminology and it's an uh, it's an emerging research field i would say that is focusing on trying to applying machine learning to these problems which, which share these type of properties that I was just listing up here. And uh, the idea here is that you somehow try to cherry pick from the two modeling paradigms. So you have the one modeling paradigm, which is highly uh, domain specific handcrafted models. That is the typical bread and butter for scientific computing and applied mathematics. And on the other hand, you have these more generic uh, data driven approaches. I, actually, they are also becoming more and more domain specific, but nevertheless, you try to fuse these two modeling paradigms. That's, I would say, a very typical uh, philosophy in, in, in scientific machine learning. And typically it amounts to boils down to picking a loss function while you're doing the learning that is in one way or, or another more adapted to the domain than what you would usually see in machine learning applications. And the other one is to pick architectures for the neural networks that are very adapted to the specific problems that you're dealing with. And we'll see an example of both of these uh, as we go on here. So this was just a very short pitch talk about scientific machine learning. I would actually highly recommend this. Uh, Veinan E has made a nice opinion piece in AMS notices that is quite, quite well read. If you're interested in these slides, you just let me know and I'll give it to you. <laughs> 
So let's proceed then. Let's talk about inverse problems then. So inverse problems, I would say, is a good candidate for machine learning approaches. And I'll come back in a second to why. In general, an inverse problem tries to answer the question, what gives rise to observations? So in that sense, it's, it's essentially amounts to running a simulator backwards. So you essentially, you have a simulator at hand and you want to know what you need to put into the simulator to get a desired output. And these type of problems pops up in imaging and all kinds of uh, example areas. And in particular, if you talk about tomography, which is an imaging technology, where you, tomography is essentially uh, deals with exposing or radiating an object from different directions with a source. It could be a particle or a wave. And clearly you get a kind of projection image like in this shadow example here. And obviously a single such projection image won't be enough for you to recover the interior structure or the shape of this object. So you need to think, you would of course take multiple of these projection images. And the question now is how you do, the, how you do it. So essentially this is an example how you would essentially scan an object repeatedly with an with a, with a X-ray scanner. And then from these 2D images that you can see, you want to computationally recover the interior structure. So that's a typical inverse problem. Now, inverse problems are challenging for two reasons. One, which is the, an in, they have often come with an intrinsic instability, which means that any attempt at picking the signal or the thing that we want to recover that is maximally consistent with observed data is going to be unstable procedures. So that's going to be essentially amounts to overfitting. So they are ill-posed and they all often, uh, in, in particular, so in imaging, they are high, uh, large scale, right? So imaging application, for example, the digitized signal and data are quite high dimensional arrays after you have digitized them. Now the ill posedness part, you can deal with in mathematics by using what is called regularization theory. Regularization essentially uh, handles this instability by balancing the need to fit the data against overfitting. So there are two natural components that come into the game here now. One is the data likelihood part, which essentially models how well you fit the, 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 the observed data with your signal. And, uh, and the other part is the prior part, which is essentially supposed to be an a priori specification of what you mean by a natural signal. And, and here now you can already see why my inverse problems would be a good candidate for machine learning approaches, because it would make sense, often you have a good idea of the data likelihood from the physics of how you gathered your data. So this thing can be handcrafted using physical models, whereas the prior is a bit less, you know, it's, that's more like, uh, it's more natural to try to learn the prior instead of handcrafting it. So let's move on to formalizing this thing a bit. So essentially you have a, one way of formalizing inverse problems to set up an operator equations. So you have A here, which is this, which is called the forward operator, which essentially um, uh, tells you uh, how you how you how you generate noise-free data, right? And then you have measured data y, and then there is some observation noise e, which is a random variable. So you can argue that y is a sample of this object here, and x star is the unknown signal that you want to recover. Uh, this is the classical way of introducing inverse problems. Uh, a bit of a downside with this philosophy is that it, it views the signal as a deterministic quantity. So it's, it's hard to talk about uncertainty quantification in a more systematic manner. So one could also start viewing the signal as being generated by a random variable, in which case it doesn't necessarily make sense to, to recover the signal, then it more becomes a statistical problem. And you talk about recovering the probability distribution of the signal given the data, the conditional distribution. And this kind of brings us to the Bayesian paradigm of inverse problems, where, where you have, uh, again, the data is suddenly now a, an example of a conditional random variable. And here we, this innocent looking change is that the, sing, the deterministic uh, signal is now replaced by the stochastic random variable X. And we have the unknown signal still there that you're conditioning on for the data. And then you want to recover the posterior. Now the posterior here is of course, describes all possible solutions, right? So that would be essentially the, the most honest answer to the inverse problem. 
In any case, you can apply Bayes' theorem here and you can uh, express the, the, the posterior in terms of a data like than a prior. You, you need to, of course, specify the prior. But in any case, uh, and, and there's some beautiful mathematical theory that has been developed that also deals with how the posterior distribution behaves asymptotically as the noise level tends to zero. But nevertheless, uh, this, uh, if you take a look at 3D tomographic imaging, in, for example, in clinical medicine, let's take a look at the problem size, just to get a feeling for, if you would try to, to roll out such, a, such, a, such an approach in, in practical applications, what struggles would you be having? First of all, you need to specify a prior to begin with, but apart from that, you're dealing with a huge computational problem here because in medical imaging, an, an sample of this random variable X is about, well, in 3D, it's about 130 million dimensional array. And the data Y, which is innocent looking, is about 800 million dimensional array. And the operator A here is an integral operator that is a linear operator, but it integrates the discretized function over lines. So clearly for such problems, imaging problems, uh, recovering the posterior is just out of the cup question is just computationally too complex. So what we do is that we try to either recover a, an estimator that summarizes the posterior, let's say the mean, or we want to generate samples. And we're going to do use deep learning for both of these tasks. And I want to emphasize here that the estimator that's been recovered is not a reconstruction, it's not a recovery of X star, an estimator is a reconstruction method. And that's an important distinction, right? So the, once you're done with your estimator, you have a reconstruction method. So the deep direct estimation is the philosophy of recovering the estimator, right? So again, I'm just reformulating the inverse problem. We want to recover what I call a suitable estimator of this conditional random variable here. And we are given a single sample of the data conditioned on the unknown image, right? Now, when you think about machine learning in this context or deep learning, uh, you can use deep learning in many, many different ways to address this problem, recovering an estimator. The first question you need to ask yourself is what estimator do you want to compute? Or you might turn the table and say, what type of training data do I even have? So typically you let the training data guide how you're gonna use machine learning. So essentially the type of training data coupled with how you choose to set up your learning problem is going to essentially imply the type of estimator you're trying to compute. And this part has nothing, the what part has nothing to do with machine learning. It's pure statistical decision theory. Then there's the how part. That is then when you start parameterizing the, the estimators with the choosing the architecture here, and then you need to train all this. So being a bit more concrete, so if you have, if you assume, for example, imaging, capital X will be possible images, right? 2D, 3D images. Capital Y would be possible tomographic data. Again, huge high dimensional arrays, or these are spaces of huge high dimensional arrays. And here's a table just showing you the type of estimators that you can compute by using deep learning. And I'm, I, now given that we are constrained for time, nevertheless, I'm only just gonna pick one example. So I'm gonna show you how you can compute the posterior mean, which is a special case of a Bayes estimator from, from, the, from the, and that's a quite a natural attempt at summarizing the entire distribution of solutions for the inverse problem, right? So the task is to recover the posterior mean. Again, we have the same inverse problem. We have a single sample, et cetera, et cetera. And what we're gonna do here is that we're, going to, we're not gonna specify the, the prior for X and, and then try to use Bayes theorem or something like that. We're gonna do, we're gonna look at the samples we have, which is our training data, which are random draws from this joint uh, random variable of images and corresponding data. And the first thing is that we're gonna rephrase our aim as a statistical learning problem. So it's well known that you can uh, express the posterior mean as minimizing the square two norm. That's a known fact from, from statistics. So essentially I'm rephrasing the posterior mean as an optimization problem over, over uh, where I'm looking for possible, each R here is a reconstruction method. So I'm minimizing over all possible reconstruction methods and picking the one 
that this has the, on average, here's the average part, on average has the least error in the L squared L2 sets. Obviously doing this expectation is unfeasible. We don't know the distribution of the joint distribution here because we don't want to specify the prior for X. We have the likelihood, right? but, we, but we don't want to specify the prior. So we simply replace the expectation here with the empirical counterpart. And then the next question is, of course, you don't want to optimize over all possible reconstruction methods that are just computationally unfeasible. So you do pick a family of computational methods where you do, where you optimize over, and that's where the uh, art, deep learning architecture comes into the game. So if you pick a generic architecture here now, at least for a 3D problem, you would need something like 10 to the power 16 parameters in this network. And then you already see here how the problems are mounting here about how to get the training data for training this thing. So what we're gonna do is that we're gonna, you're gonna pick an architecture for the deep learning network that is adapted in the sense that it knows about the forward operator, right? This forward, we know that R theta is supposed to be roughly the inverse of A, right? That's what, that's what we want a regularized inverse of A. And that's where scientific machine learning component comes in. So without flashing too many formulas, how do you formulate such, a, such an architecture for a deep neural network? What you do is the following. You start with an iterative scheme that kind of converges to a suitable approximation of A inverse. Now, since the inverse problem was ill posed, you don't want to get the A inverse, even though you had A inverse analytically, you would not want to use it, right? So you need to approximate it in a suitable manner. So you can pick one out of many schemes that are available in, in, the, in the literature. There are many to choose from. So here is the input data Y that you measure up here to the, to the left. And bottom right is the output of this operator, the R. So the, this entire scheme is an iterative scheme that is alternating between the X spaces, which the Y space, which is the top row, and the X space, which is the bottom row. Now, ideally this scheme would go on forever, right? And in the limit, it would approximate A inverse. So you truncate this scheme. In this case, we stop it after one, two, three iterations, right? And then we replace these updating operators with small neural networks. Now, each of these guys, are not necessarily that deep, could be five or six layers, something like that, but they are stacked. And this whole thing is now a deep neural network that is trained end to end. So keep in mind here that the A operators here is there and that's not learned. These are handcrafted, these are not learned. And in this case, A was linear. So this A adjoint also. So these are kept as handcrafted components in there. So this is an example of how this is called unrolling. You're, unroll you're truncating and then unrolling an iterative method. And then you could add further domain adaptation. You could ensure that the network has certain group invariance properties or certain convexity. If it's a real valued mapping, then it would be convexity. You could enforce that type of stuff and so on and so on. So you could combine this with a quite a rich a toolbox of, of tailoring your network architecture to your problem. So let's see how this thing pans out then. So this is a uh, tomograph, 2D tomography example. Uh, we are recovering a, a, a five, 12 by 512 image. To, here I'm showing you the data here to the right, uh, which is about a million data points. And we're gonna show you three methods. One is called analytic pseudo inverse. That's essentially a regularized inverse of A, the standard method that's used in the clinical scanners. And the two next methods are machine learning approaches. One that is using a machine learning for denoising purposes. So it, it doesn't go, it's unaware of the physics. So it tries to fix the deficiencies of the first method. And the other one is the one deep direct explanation that I was just uh, introducing to you guys. So again, the, the ground truth you can see here just as a comparison, you don't know the, the, the left image you're, you're not supposed to know, right? And the data is here to the right. So if you apply, and then I'm just highlighting two regions, we wanna keep this region homogeneous. We want to, and we don't want to wash out this feature here, right? That's what we want to avoid. So this is what you get by, by this noisy data, you get this type of reconstruction. So a clinical uh, doctor would here say that you need to take better data. That's quite a natural response. So you get the streak that's not supposed to be there. You get this false feature there, which is not supposed, which is not existing over here, right? Uh, 
So this is a, this is a bad reconstruction for all purposes and means. For those of you who know about compressed sensing, you can say you can apply compressed sensing philosophy. It's not going to change so much. You're still going to get the streak. But let's look at what happens when you apply uh, denoising. Well, the denoiser uh, or, or, or will do something like this. So the streak is there. The false feature up here is still there. The, you have almost washed out this true feature. So honestly, from a, from a PSNR, it gets better and so on. But from a clinical perspective, you haven't really gained that much. So if you wonder about what's the impact of including the physics in the neural network versus not doing it, it's the difference about with this image to the right and the next one. So by including the physics, you suddenly get rid of the false streak here. And you actually get rid of the false feature up here in the second enlarged region to the left. And you actually highlight a bit more the true uh, feature there. And also you can look at the number of parameters. The denoiser has 10 to the power seven parameters, whereas this physics informed reconstruction network has on, only has quarter of a million parameters, right? So, so it gives you, a few, and also the execution times are quite feasible. So it shows you the importance of in, including the physics into the, into the problem. What about theory then? Well, there's actually almost no theory for these things. There are some recent paper, 75 page long paper in ArcSive that is trying to uh, flesh out. Um, there's ample numerical evidence showing that these deep neural networks that are domain adapted by, that they obtain by unrolling are totally outperforming more generic approaches and also actually non-machine learning approaches. But theoretically, there is very little results that are supporting this observation. Uh, but there are some pro, uh, estimates of the of the generalization gap, the performance gaps, and so on. But these estimates are too crude to be useful in practice, honestly speaking. So they could be guiding you a bit, indicating why unrolling is a better to, to, to use than maybe more generic network. But it doesn't really. Uh, it's not use. It's not like the Shannon sampling theorem where you can say, ah, I can use this as a guiding principle. Now I'm running out of time brutally fast, actually, but I'm looking at the clock. So I'm, go I'm going to go even faster, I'm sorry. So we can also use machine learning to, to, to sample from a posterior. So what we was, what I was showing you previously was that we compute a single estimator. Now let's try to sample from the posterior. That's, that's uh, actually another interesting aspect. So you might have heard about GANs from deep fakes and so on. So you can set up a GAN generative adversarial network and that's a, that's a well-known uh, approach to sample from a high dimensional probability distribution, which is given only implicitly in terms of training data. And what we did is that we, we formulated the conditional version of the GAN and using the Wasserstein distance to sim measure similarity between probability distributions and use that as to train that in order to, sip to sample from the posterior distribution. So essentially you're trying to solve a problem like that where W is the Wasserstein distance. It's a distance notion in, in probability distributions. Uh, here's the posterior one. This is the target distribution you want to approximate. And this is the generator that you're training. And what you can use, you can use the reformulation of the Wasserstein distance. So you can reformulate this expected minimization problem as this minimax problem, which is now in the GAN formulation. And then you, the train generator would then be your uh, sampling machinery. And of course, you can use this uh, to sample. Here's again an example now. So here's a phantom. Here is a, I'm not showing you the data. It's a pretty bad data, very noisy. So filter back this analytic pseudo inverse would look like this, pretty bad. And then you can apply total variation, maybe some compressed sensing idea. It doesn't look that much better. And here's the single sample from the posterior. But of course, it's a single sample, right? So if you take another sample, it's going to be different. So if you go on taking samples like this, you can, of course, use them to compute the posterior mean. That's what you can use as well. And each sample takes about 20 milliseconds to generate. And this example has 512 squared. Uh, so it's, it's about, uh, yeah, it's 512 squared dimensional problem, right? So it's, it's a quite a high dimensional problem. So. Now, you can use this also for a clinical case where you can do, I'm gonna actually bypass this example because I wanna say something about PDs. So I'm gonna rush through this and say, we skip this. 
I'm just showing you how you can also estimate the standard deviation, point-wise standard deviation and so on by this technique. So essentially moving on directly. Yeah, here, I want to highlight this part. So these GANs are trained only on data from nine patients, 2000 slices, right? So it's 2000 pairs of 2D image corresponding high dose data or normal dose data and that's being used for training purposes. And it takes a couple of days to train this thing, it's quite tricky. But once trained, it takes about 20 milliseconds to generate one sample. So it totally outperforms Markov J Monte Carlo on these kind of methods. But of course, it doesn't have any theoretical guarantees, right? That's the, that's the never ending story. So this was in 25 minutes, this was <laughs> inverse problems and, and machine learning in that context. So I have a couple of more minutes here to say something about partial differential equations because that's another totally different field. And I'm not gonna talk about, of course you can talk about inverse problems in partial differential equations like a PDE parameter estimation. I'm not gonna talk about that. I'm gonna talk about actually solving PDEs. So there are, and this is a, I would say a very active research area. So I'm, I need to cherry pick quite carefully. So what I, and there are papers coming out essentially on a daily basis. Uh, so uh, I'm gonna look at two aspects. Hopefully I have time to go through those. One is solving a PDE by using a train. So essentially you're training a network to solve a specific given PDE. And ideally you're targeting a challenging PDE which is non-linear and high dimensional, something like that where normal methods are struggling. And the other one is actually more ambitious uh, idea. Here the PDE is typically parameterized by some function, let's say, and you want the parameter to solution map. So here the trained deep neural network would actually be uh, generate a solution operator, not only a solution. So if you look about solving PDEs first, of course, nonlinear PDEs, high dimensional, this is an old problem. You might have heard about the curse of dimensionality where the uh, computational effort grows exponentially as the dimension of the PD grows. And of course, the standard methods that are mentioned up here are struggling with, with problems of that kind. Uh, and in particular, they cannot overcome this curse of dimensionality. So the idea here now is to really mimic what we did for inverse problems, right? Remember when we introduced machine learning for inverse problems, we started out by rephrasing the inverse problem as a statistical learning problem, this expectation thing. Remember when I started out from the conditional mean, and I mapped that to minimizing an, an L2 expectation of the square norm of the deviations, right? So you need to do something similar. You need to take the solving the PDE problem, which is intuitively has nothing to do with statistics, right? It's a purely deterministic formulation. And you need to map that to statistical learning problem. And that of course involves also choosing the loss function and, and ultimately it depends on the type of training data you have. And then of course, it. The next step is then to pick a sensible architecture for the network, right? For solving the statistical learning problems. So that's roughly how the PDE approaches are also structured. And the first very natural thing that comes to mind is to form uh, that certain PDEs can be reformulated in terms of stochastic differential equations. So here I'm just slamming a semi-linear parabolic PDE here in front of you. And of course, many PDEs that are, some of them are listed here. One, one is from mathematical finance. That are, yeah, they are, this next one is from control theory and so on. They are in this category, similar category. And these are the references that I'm gonna follow. So the starting point here is that we're gonna rephrase a PD of this kind as a stochastic differential equation. And I'm gonna bypass so I'm calling this, yeah, one approach is to, to use the backwards stochastic differential equation formulation. So if, if you start with a linear PDE first, then there are feynman kac type of formulas for, for, for reformulating that be expressing the solution in terms of such uh, stochastic optimization problems. And then the next step is to rephrase the stochastic optimization problem as a base estimator. So if you're gonna compare with the inverse problems example I had, this was the posterior mean type of thing. And this is the statistical learning problem that we are going to tackle with the machine learning approach. And then of course the, the trained deep neural network will essentially be an approximation of this estimator. 
So it's not actually not that different from the inverse problems philosophies. It's quite quite similar in that sense. But then you may say, what about non-linear PDs? Then well, what happens is then that you have to think a bit more. One approach is the deep, deep splitting approach, approximation where you partition the time interval into sub-intervals, and in each of the sub-intervals you are you have a linear PD that's a pure theory result, and then you are using these deep learning approximations on each of these sub-intervals, and then you stack these networks on top of each other. So you're going to get very, very deep networks depending on how fine your time partitioning is. In any case, the, the, the going is essentially that you have a PD, you have a stochastic formulation as a stochastic differential equation, you map that to a learning problem, and then you address the learning problem by machine learning. That's roughly how it goes. And there's some connection to reinforcement learning, but I'm going to skip that right now. So I'm going to skip the general formulation in the interest of time and go directly to example. So let's start with a linear heat equation, very innocent looking example. It looks like that, right? And then here is a typical formulation as a stochastic differential equation. So at the terminal time, you can have, you have initial conditions and at the terminal time, you have the solution here. You can write it as this expectation here. And then it turns out that this one you can rephrase by minimization instead, just like we did when we were dealing with the posterior mean, right? And now this formulation is very suitable for machine learning because the V here, you simply replace by a deep neural network. Sorry, that was, uh, sorry. So we're gonna use deep learning. So we replace the V here with a deep neural network with a suitable architecture. And then you, of course, replace this expectation here with the empirical counterpart and use training data. And that's roughly it. And uh, uh, when you have a nonlinear component here, so you have a semi-linear heat equation, you have this Lipschitz uh, term here that adds to it. Then you do the deep, deep splitting approach. You approximate the time into these intervals. In each interval, you have this learn, you have the linear uh, heat equation, right? So, so, so this is a purely theoretical result, the splitting result here. And then you apply, you, each UK, you approximate the deep neural network, and then you stack all these networks on top of each other. And then the whole thing is trained end to end. And then you might ask, well, does this overcome the curse of dimensionality? Well, there is no formal proofs that it will do in general. That's the short answer. But there's, there's a bunch of uh, results that actually shows for specific PDs that these type of DNN approaches, deep neural network approaches can overcome the curse of dimensionality in the sense that there exists a network with, a certain, with these properties that the, the number of parameters of the network glows at most polynomially. So here are some examples. So this is a very active research area on the theory side. Now I'm almost 32 minutes into this talk when I look at my watch. So I might have some time to say some, and these are about architectures. I'm gonna skip that part. And just, I want to say some words about physics informed neural networks. And then I think I'm out of time actually. So the idea is here is even simpler. It's, it's much less mathematical and more engineering philosophy. You start with your PD here. You don't bother about any backward stochastic differential equations. You just say that, oh, Solving this PD, maybe I can just rephrase it as minimizing this uh, square two norm over some suitably chosen probability measure, right? And you want to choose this mu so that you can sample from it in a simple manner. And, and then, of course, what you see here, of course, this, this integral is just an expectation, right? That's what it is. So, what you can see here is that you've essentially done a physics informed loss. That's what you've done. And then, so essentially you take the, here's the PD is popping up. The PD is, you essentially put the PD into the loss here, right? And then you replace the V with a deep neural network. Of course, you might have side constraints, so you can do this a bit more generally. If you have a bunch of PDs and these are a number of PDs and number of initial or, or constraints, you can formulate this. This is the loss term that is accounting for the PDE. And these are the initial and boundary conditions. And this is the approach that you can roll out. And this is essentially summarized and called physics informed neural networks, solving PDs in this way. So I know I'm jumping back and forth and it's a lot of material. So I'm actually, I think I'm out of time given what Andy was recommending me. There is some beautiful 
resolution. The most cool part is actually the parameter solution map, but I'm out of time. So maybe maybe that will be for the next lecture. I don't know. So I'll, I'll choose to stop here. <laughs>